This meeting is being recorded. Um, little, little Methodist history. Uh, the United Methodist Church came into being. It was voted in 68, came into being in 1972. It was a merger of the Evangelical United Brethren Church, which is mostly in the Midwest. Um, was a joint venture of Methodist Protestant, Methodist Episcopal South, Methodist Episcopal North. So that's kind of where we came from. And since 1972, uh, we've been discussing some of these issues. Um, discussing, uh, you know, what, what scripture says, and discussing you know, what our discipline says. Um, how we are to minister to all. You know, these are big issues. Um, so no, none of this is new under the sun. It's been here. Um, it's just that now, in this particular time and place, um, there's a little bit of more sense of an urgency because there's a definite plan to make a definite decision uh, about how we move forward. And so that's kind of where we got here. And I can go into more detail with all that stuff later if you need to, want to. Um, but there's a lot of uh, conversations that have gone on at the general conference level. And remember, in the United Methodist Church, the only body that can officially speak for the entire church is general conference. Um, I could have my own opinion, but I can't speak for the entire United Methodist Church. Uh, district superintendent, bishop, they can have their own opinions. They cannot speak for the entire United Methodist Church. Now, having said that, there is the consideration, there is the concern that, you know, um, if so you go to scripture for Corinthians, if, if this part of the body is sick, it affects the rest of the body. You know, and so that, that's, that's a legitimate concern. You know, um, let's, let's take, we have to take that into account. Um, so in the last, I'm about to say last general conference, but man, it's been a, it's a, been a convoluted mess. Um, COVID did not do us any favors. Um, we postponed once, postponed twice, postponed three times. Um, and so we still, there, there are proposals that a lot of plans were made on. There was a protocol for separation. Um, it was put out there. A lot of people got real excited about it because there were people from all different aspects. There were Protestants, there were progressives, there were conservatives, there were centrists, there were just a variety of people who said, this is our best way of moving forward. Well, when they postponed general conference again, there were a number of people that said, well, I don't think that is the best way forward anymore. And, and so it is still technically alive but I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Um, and that's that's why I'm thinking at this point. And other, others have made that same opinion. There's a group of progressives who have said, yeah, we're, we're taking away our support for that. Um, there's a group of conservatives who said, we're going to go ahead and launch a new denomination you know, based on their look at things. So, you know, even though the protocol is still there, it may still happen. Right now, people are moving on as it is. Okay, so that's kind of where we are, general church wide. Um, again, the meeting at 24. And we'll go through this some more. But the book of discipline, again, we are still acting under the 2016. Yeah, 2016, 2021, the last one. That book of discipline. Nothing has changed. Um, now, there's a lot of people who think. They ought to change it, and that happens every general conference. You know, that's, that's what general conference is for. Okay, let's tweak this, let's tweak that, let's do this, let's do that. That's its job. But right now, none of the current proposals, none of the current, hey, I think the church should go this direction or that direction, none of those have any weight, official weight. You know, because they're not, they have not been adopted in the church law. Now again, we're called to make the decision 
our best decision according to the information we have. And so that's what we're trying to do, trying to share with you the information that we have. Um, so our little handout here, um, I pulled some stuff together. Um, we're also, I want to let you know, this will be available. Um, we're saving this as a PDF. There's going to be a special web page um, that you can access via link only. I don't want to just stick it out there on our website. But all of you will have access to that. We'll have a copy of this. There'll be a copy of the recording. And I'm also putting up on there various websites with information related to this. Everything from Resource UNC, North Georgia UNC, to the Wesley Covenant Association, to the Global Methodist uh, Church's website. Um, there's a couple others that have been suggested to me. We're going to put those up there. If there are questions that are answered that are asked tonight that we cannot answer, then I'll be as honest as I can with you. Um, if I don't know, I don't know, but I'll find out. And so we will post any questions and any answers. On that web page as well. That's kind of how we want to move forward with this. And as, as you've heard me say before, um, you know, my goal here, folks, when, you know, when I got the call late in the process, it was a surprise. I was supposed to go back to our schools for a tip here. Um, we got the call to come to Douglasville. Uh, why not? Up like we always pack up and we move down here like we always do, and we have fallen over this place and fallen over this church. And our goal is to preach Jesus, love my people, and serve my people. And I will continue to do that all the way through all of this. So um, if, if, I, if I tell you sometimes, hold that thought, we've got something to do. So that, that's my goal. But I also know the importance of this conversation. I get it. I get it. So anyway, there we are. Um, so we've got this table of contents. You see what we I wanted to kind of reiterate some things. This letter that the leadership board sent to you um, with the two uh, information sessions that were available for people to go to, one from the Global Methods Church, one from Bishop Sue and Randy Hardy and, and Dr. Jessica Carroll. Um, personally speaking, they were not as, as informative as I hoped they would be. But you know, the, the, the hindsight's going to it. So we're trying to make up for some of that. Um, so the whole process, the reason for the urgency now is In one of the things that passed at the last general conference, there was, there was actually a, uh, an amendment that got posted, and it, it passed on two votes, which is fine. Um, but there became a way for churches to disagree in a matter of conscience related to this particular issue, okay, that they could disaffiliate from the United States Church. And now there have always been ways. They were a lot more complicated and a lot more expensive. You know, I checked into that. I mean, it really was. Um, there have been churches that had this affiliated in North Georgia Congress a number of years ago. Um, you know, there have been churches that have split. Um, the churches that have closed. And I remember serving a church over in Covington, and my, cat, my secretary was a member of one of the independent methods it was United Methodist. And they were prepared. They had stocked away, some of the members stocked away some money. They had bought some land. And they were prepared to chunk the keys to the BS if they didn't do what they needed to do. And so I, I, I heard that from her. I passed on the word. I said, you might need to make a pastoral call. And so they worked it out. They did. Um, but it was was touching over there for a while. So right now, there is a way um, to disaffiliate, it's a fun word for you, um, to separate from the United Methodist Church. And the biggest issue there is the trust clause. Okay? 200 and some odd years ago, when the United Methodist, the Methodist Church was created, it made sense 
or the larger denomination, the whole property in trust. Okay? Uh, for the local congregation. That made sure there would always be a church in that location. It makes sense 200 years ago. Maybe not so much now. Uh, and there's, I think part of that is just our, our culture. You know, we won't, we, it was our blood, sweat, and tears that built this church. Your blood, sweat, and tears that built this church. I understand this. And so there is, even without the theological issues, there is this issue of us being our own church. That's part of this issue, right? So the disaffiliation process allows the group, if they so choose, to leave with a certain cost um, and retain their property. Okay. The reason this is so urgent is currently that amendment in the general conference law, the door closes at the end of 2023. Now, again, depending on who you talk to, some things that some people think there'll be another door. Some people say there won't be. And that, that's conjecture, that's a thing. We don't know. That's the truth. We do not know. What we do know is there is this process to name. And so we want to consider it. You know, what, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for our church? And what does it mean for our ministry moving forward? So you see in here a message from the cabinet on church conferences. All right, this is from the website, the conference website. And it talks a little bit about the dates and stuff. And then um, you see the steps of this affiliation process immediately after that. That's from the trustees, the North Park Conference. But that, that is the legalese from the Methodist Microbes. This is what it's called. Here. Now, here, here are the issues. Let's make sure we hear this clear. I've heard people and I've had people say to me, we've got to vote this year. And I get the urgency. The process ends next year. But Here's the here's the dots and the T's. All right, here is the, the intricate. Only the church board, in our case, the church council, and then the board, in our case, the leadership board, they are the only entity that is authorized, not the pastor. Um, only group that is authorized to ask the district superintendent to call a church conference in order to vote on disaffiliation. We cannot ask the DS until January, at least January, sometime between January 1 and February 28th. So there can be no vote this year. It's just they won't accept it. But, and this is something we, we've been talking about, it's we're, you know, the board's going to make a decision this year. We're going to talk, we talk about it every week. We will continue to talk about it, continue, continue to pray about it. Um, and, and sometime by the end of the year, you know, I'm, I'm committed to this. I think John and the rest of the committee is committed to this. We will make a decision as to whether to ask or not. You know, that's that's the first decision that has to be made. Okay, there's that. Um, we understand that if the board says no, we don't want to have a church conference. That is making a decision. Now, that's just, it is. Um, part of our heartbreak and part of my sweetest nights is saying, okay, what's going to cause the least amount of harm to this church, to my church? And so that's kind of what we're going back and forth. That's why I'm going back and forth. The uh, board votes. If they vote, yes, we want to have a church conference. All right. We present that certified to the district superintendent sometime between January 1 and January 2. We send that to them. They get back to us. And sometime after February 2, we'll have a church conference. Here's some good methodologies for you a charge conference with the 
we normally hear about is the members of the leadership board and your nominating team. They represent the church. It's a charge conference, and that's what we normally do. We have one every year. Our charge conference this year is November 13th. Um, that's where we turn in nominations and we accept the apportionments and all the other stuff that go with bureaucracy. Um, a church conference is where every professing member goes. Okay. So this obviously I think it's a little important when we talk about church conference. Um, we would ask for a church conference. It would happen sometime after February 28th. We don't know when. Um, and, and I appreciate uh, you see the disaffiliation checklist. This comes from the North Georgia Wesleyan Covenant Association. Uh, we've had a group look at that and check. I, I tweaked it just a little bit, added a date there, but it is it is accurate as far as I can tell. As far as I can tell, according to the rules and regulations of the conference. So this is kind of the process right here. Um, one of the things we'll be doing, and it's one of those things we needed to do it anyhow, like any church, um, let me ask you a question. How many members do we have here that is the first? Over a thousand, 12, I think it's 1,200. Um, and everybody's shaking their head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that we're going to be doing that we again, probably should have done anyway is we're going to be verifying membership lists. Um, you'll be getting phone calls. You'll be getting letters. Um, all that fun stuff. We will check, you know, just to verify. If, it's, if we already have any ways that we're, you know, we're going to say, hey, Mike, this is Roger from the church. We're looking at our database and degrees that says you join the church here. You might say, yep, no, thank you very much. It's been verified. You know, we're not going to you know, cross-examine people. We're going to take your word for that. Um, but we're going to make sure. We're going to go through. And we're going to try to reach out to members who haven't been active in a while. This may be the very, this may be the silver lining that gets them involved with. Uh, they want to come and be part of this. Uh, but at the, at the church conference, when we vote, if we vote, you know, um, you will have to be present. You cannot zoom in. You cannot vote by proxy. You cannot vote absentee. Okay, you got to be um, And my understanding is it'll be by paper ballot, which I think is, you know, and we will find out that day. There will be tellers and they will count and they will present the findings that day. So, um, again, process. You see here, I'm looking through this, um, it's a two thirds vote of those professing members that are present. So it's not two thirds of 1200, it's two thirds of 300 or 500 or 250, whatever's there. You know, um, so that's going to be an important day for people to get here. Um, after the church votes, again, here's some more details. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, to vote whether to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church is only one of the one of the uh, votes that we have to make, one of the decisions that we would have to make. Um, do you remain independent? You know, that means you're not affiliated with any uh, denomination. Do you want to go to the global Methodist Church? And that's where we have the most information from, is the new denomination. Do you join with the Free Methodists, the Nazarenes, the Wesleyans? Um, there's other smaller Methodist churches. Do you become a part of that? Um, I was talking to someone the other day and said one of the uh, advantages, and you got to be honest, one of the advantages is that the apportionment bill goes away. Okay. This is, uh, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, but then, where do you get your pastor? That, 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 that becomes a real serious question um, if you go in a different path. You know, how do you get past it? What does that look like? You have to, you lose your umbrella under the United Methodist Church's 
nonprofit status. We have to go out and get our own nonprofit status. But again, it's 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 not terribly complicated, but it does take some work. I've worked with some who've done that before, and I've actually had a conversation with some folks here about what it would take to do that. Um, so there's you know there's a lot of other questions that we would need to come to terms with if you decide not to go back, if you decide to go back. Um, after annual conference, okay, so that's, so we'll say that's um, March 15th. If you go to this affiliate, at annual conference that year, early June, um, the clergy session, we're the ones that voted, we did it this year, we, this, there were 70 that was affiliated. Um, you know, it was still sad. Um, there were tears shed. But there wasn't any ruckus on the floor over it. And I don't anticipate that, you know, going forward. Um, you've heard a lot about how much will it cost. Okay. Um, currently, in, in each conference business different. It's part of the fun of this. Currently, North Georgia is actually one of the, I think, fairer of the conferences that are others that add a whole lot more than North Georgia does. But from the moment disaffiliation occurs, say that would be December 31st of 2023, you would owe the 12 months prior apportionments, which we normally pay month by month. So that will have already been paid. That's eighty thousand dollars is what we pay, and then you would owe another twelve months. So there's eighty thousand, and then you would pay a portion of the unfunded pension liability for okay. um, Which, when I was at Powder Springs two years ago, I looked, and Powder Springs is about half the size of Um Forty thousand portion is eighty thousand. And at that point in time, Power Springs owed 40000 in back in the unfunded. But since then, there have been some funds that have been transferred into that across the denomination. And so now, as of last week, it showed that Douglasville owed an additional 35000 So a little bit less, it's come down. So you're talking $115,000 to $120,000. That is the, the check we would have to write by the end of 2023 um, for the disaffiliation of that place. Uh, um, so th th there's the process. Um, the questions and here are the concerns that we want to address is you've got, and I've had conversations with all these parties, you've got folks who, who believe that um, The brand United Methodist is damaged, and it is affecting our ministry here in Douglasville. You've got some folks who say, sometimes it's, it's the same folks you know, who say, um, you know, the United Methodist Church has meant so much to me in my life. There have been so many things that have happened under its umbrella that have blessed so many people. And you know, both of those are opinions, and, and both, in a sense, have some truth to them, if we want to be honest. There's a group of people that say, I want my church to be my church. You know, uh, we often call that the messy middle. You know, I love my church. I love my people. I don't want really, really anything to change. And the team. there was a part of me at the beginning of this process, I was like, I want to be a, an ostrich. I want to spit my head in a second. I want to wish that this would go away, but it's not. So you got to, I mean, this is what we're thinking about. Um, some people say, with the way the United Methodist Church is, is tending, trending, and because there are people within the United Methodist Church who are disobeying the current system, we do not think we can exist anymore within that framework. 
it's time for us to leave. There are people on the other side who say, this is a matter of justice. This is a matter of just like um, race, just like gender. You know, it, it's, it's a matter of justice. We love God, we love Jesus, we love the gospel, we love our brothers and sisters. And we need to, and if, if, if the church votes to move in a different direction, then there are some who said, we'll leave. You, know, you, got, you got on either side. And then there are some who say, you know, why can't we just all get along? Why can't we? I, I may disagree with you, but I still love you. And there's some legitimacy to that. But there are, again, some on the, on the edges, on the sides, on the fringes, sorry, who said, we've tried that. It, it's not working. It's time to move on. All of those have legitimacy. All of, all of those opinions are represented here within the church. So how do we move forward? That's the question. Um, I put in here, again, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of opinions out there on both sides, on all sides of this issue. Um, I'm trying to put in what I think, you know, this is the official word for the United Methodist Church. Boom. Okay, this is what we'll say. And so I put in some of those, their answers. Um, again, you may say, yeah, this looks right, but I've heard that before. You know, that, that's, that's your choice. But here is the information. Um, there are two different pieces that compare the United Methodist Church and the Global Methodist Church. Um, I apologize for the quality of one of the copies here that come out like that side, but it's a good side by side. And again, the Global Methodist Church is the biggest body and the biggest opportunity. It's not the only one, but it's the one that most people are comparing to the MCT. So this is, this is where we are. Um, so you've got that. Take it home, read it, think about it, pray about it. There's a letter from the Council of Bishops. Um, I put the following here because I thought it was some, some good words. This is from Chris Ritter, one of the uh, heads of the Wesley Covenant Association. He's a pastor in Indiana, Illinois, somewhere, somewhere out there. He says, my advice to any congregation is know who you are, know what Jesus has called you to, and know your mission for it. If the United Methodist Church is the best fit for your identity, Use this time to invest. If, if you're, uh, just as some congregations will find a better fit in the future, you'll see others will be better served than the global Methodist Church. I, I like that. That was fair. It says, you know, if this is who you are, be true to who you are. If this isn't, you know, try to find where you fit, where you should be. Now, this next question comes from the Western Club Association website. We'll go I thought it gave a good overview of some of the other reasons why you might leave the United Methodist Church, other than the theology, other than the, the question about homosexuality. Um, but first, we don't want to inherit a loaded bureaucracy. There's a lot of truth in that, my friends. Um, we know that. Um, second, it says centrist and progressive movements. Well, you know, some of that I agree with others, but the, the fact is, and I've told this to a number of people, there are people on all sides of this issue who have said, this is my church. I don't know. I have dear, dear friends, conservative, progressive centrists who can claim their heritage back multiple generations in the Methodist church. And they say, this is who I am. I'm not going to leave. And, you know, I understand that. That's kind of how I feel. This is my church. You know, I don't want to leave. Yeah, anyway. anyway, so there are people like that. And so I think it finally came to a point, and this is what I like. I think the third one is the cost of continued battle is far too great. 
I think this is where a lot of people have gotten to the point. Because I've had people say, well, if they're the ones who disagree, why are they meeting? Why are we meeting? Well, it's, it's, it's not, again, people have dug in. They're saying, I'm staying, and there's a group that finally said, we're, we're done fighting. We're just done. You know, we love the Methodist Church, but we're done. I have a friend who spent 50 years as an ordained United Methodist pastor who has left. And he says, I'm, I'm done with the fight. I want to go someplace where I can really focus upon the ministry. Now, I've also heard friends who say, let's stay in the United Methodist Church and let's focus on the ministry. So both of those are legitimate. But there are people who are tired of the fight. I think that is a legitimate reason. That's one we have to talk about as much. Um, fourth, it's unwise to focus on me. My great, one of my greatest fears is to come to this church conference next year and the results are announced and a group of our church cheer and a, troop, a group of our church burst out of the tears. I, I, I pray to God that will not happen because that says they're winners and losers. What loses most of all in that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've seen this too. There will be people, you know, there, there are some of you who are, who are faithful, mature Christians. You'll find a place to worship. I, I don't worry about you. But there will be some who are brand new to the faith, some who are on the edge, and they'll look at all this fussing and fighting and this inflammatory language, and they'll say, I'm done with the faith. I am done with Christianity. That is so sad. And I pray that it will not happen. Yeah. Um, and so finally, it's theological sound of peacemakers rather than conflict sustainers. You know, and, and, and it's, and I get both sides. You know, as, as a pastor, we're called to, to be a pastor, but to be a prophet as well, to be a priest. And so there are times when you need to stand up and stand firm. I've got a good friend in Florida who is the prophet's prophet. Andy, you know, I've seen him, you know, I can't even know news and he is standing up for what he believes and he is man he is gone go. that's not my call you know um, but there are times when we need to stand up and other times when we need to pray for peace and other times when we need to just say hey God go with you my blessings go with you um, even as much as that would hurt I like this reason for hope um, my brother Bill Mayhew has his brother in Northwest Texas. Um, and so they've been talking about this. I just love the language here. So I invite you to read that and then the, the focus prayer of that. Let's pray for God's wisdom and direction for everyone in our denomination. Let's pray for those who disagree with. Let's pray for God to fill us with grace and respect as we move forward. Let's pray for our local church and its mission. Help people find and follow Jesus. As we go through this season of discernment, I want to reiterate um, first of all, for my own faith, um, we'll be having a holy communion every Wednesday night, five o'clock in the library. You are welcome to come and take with me. This is in addition to what we do on, on the first service. I just feel like there's something powerful about the Lord's Supper. So that's 5, 5.15. And then at 5.15 to 5.45, every Wednesday, at the end of the library, we will be praying for our church. That was the first United Methodist Church. We would pray. And I would love for you to come and pray with me. So that God will be glorified in all that we do and all that we say in the weeks and months to come. So, do you have questions? If you have a question, written it down. Stand those to, to John.
Again, remember, um, tomorrow in our recap, at the bottom of the email, um, I will put a uh, PDF copy of this document. So if you happen to misplace it, it's available. We'll have a link to the website uh, with other resources um, and try to have answers to questions and stuff as well. So we want to make sure everybody has this information. Well, the church council is voting to let the congregation go to the side. Um, we're committed to making that decision by the end of the Can't say what we'll decide, but I can say we're committed to, to making that decision. Um, we've recently added two members to the church council. We had two uh, uh, vacancies, and so uh, I think previously you mentioned David uh, Emerson and then Mom. So, uh, when, when you hear the names from multiple sources, that's always a good thing. So, we appreciate that they'll be there. So, we'll have a full contingent making that. And our goal is to make this decision by, by the summer. Um, with United Methodist plan to unite or join the Municipal Church, that was above my pay grade. <laughs> um, I do know there are conversations with Episcopalians, Lutherans, Catholics about doing ministry together, but nothing like that. No, no official. I don't think so. Um, but if you want me to, I can, I can do a little more research. I'll, I'll post the link about this the latest. Here's the question of the day. If I am gay, will I have to leave the church if they decide to go global? Um, our current United Methodist discipline says every person is of sacred worth. Every person is a child of God. Um, I can't say what the global Methodist church will do per se. There are indications. Um, you know, I say if you're here, you're a part of this congregation, we're going to love you. We're going to love the, the, the gossips, we're going to love the, the thieves, we're going to love anybody. Um, now, again, beyond that, I cannot say. Without, that's one I don't know. Um, I can. Find out what the global Methodist Church says, what they're currently stating. I'll find some more Okay. 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 So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So, currently, Global Methodist Church's Book of Discipline and Doctrine. Transition. Transition. Okay, thank you. There's a different name. Um, has the exact same word. So um, they, they just have the same thing. Um, I would say 90, at least 90% of the documents are exactly the same. The articles, of religion, all the things that the Methodist Church is built upon is exactly the same. Um, so now, application, we don't know. I mean, we don't know because the global Methodist Church's brains think of it. We don't know. Uh, now, there are some who will say we will treat you exactly the same as others. Uh, again, that's, that's an opinion type of thing. Um, but I cannot speak for the global Methodist Church. Why do we need to vote prior to general conference? Um, we don't know what general conference will decide. We don't. Um, there is a lot of talk that um, 
general conference will provide other avenues out. Um, but again, at this point, it's conjecture. We, we don't know. We don't know. There are people who are saying, what was the waste? Well, I mean, in one sense, they say they're, they're depending on the fact that there will be another way, but we don't know if there will be. And so that's, for a lot of people, that's the sense of urgency. Some people say, oh, well, there will be it again. I don't know. That, that's one of those gray areas. I'm trying to be as honest as I can about that. Is that UMC currently governable with 19 annual conferences professing they will not enforce our whole to, to vote? Um, my flippant answer is that's above my pay grade, but I'll try to answer it. Um, okay. Uh, is the United Methodist Church currently governable with at least 19 annual conferences professing that they will not enforce or uphold the general conference vote, the last general conference vote regarding this issue? Um, I mean, in one sense, we've been fussing and fighting for 50 years, and we've gone on. Um, now, have we done it well? Yeah, maybe not. Um, in another sense, each annual conference, it's kind of like a state. I mean, you know, there are certain things that Georgia and Alabama have in common, but certain things they don't. You know, they have the con U.S. Constitution, but then they also have the state constitution. And so there are some, you know, uh, conferences I know that, are that will continue to govern and continue to move forward. Now, will it be as effective? Will it be as efficient? Maybe not. Um, you know, that, thank you for that question. That's, that's the tough one. Um, what is the real timeline? Is there one? Well, this, this is the one we have before us. From conversations I've had with other pastors and the district superintendents and other uh, lay leaders across the, the conference, um, there's a, a belief among a certain portion of those folks that um, after 2024 or even 2028, there will be opportunities for churches to leave. And so if if the book of discipline changes, now again, if the book of discipline changes, it has not yet. Let's be very clear, it has not changed. Um, so some people think there will be an opportunity. So if, you know, Douglas will stay and six years from now something happens, if there are conference votes on something that you don't like, then there's still a possibility that you could say, hey, this is it. But all that is conjecture at this point in time. This is the one timeline we have at this point. Um, okay, I'm going to pass on this. I'm sorry. Um, why would why would the general conference feel it's necessary to change the local discipline? It changes the local discipline every four years. Now, some of those changes I agree with. Some of those changes we don't agree with. Some, like we talked about earlier, um, the church has changed the better in terms of race, in terms of gender, uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion within the, the church. I think the church has, has gotten better over the years. Um, I read an article. Actually, I, I had a copy of the article of a Methodist church in the early 60s 
and it quoted the pastor's sermon saying the African Americans uh, were uh, deficient in certain areas of black, and that is why they should not be given full membership rights. I'm glad that changed. That needed to change. Uh, now, again, this is kind of where we are. You know, do we agree that this is the time or place that we need to change or move in a different direction? That's why we're having these conversations. Uh, now, language and terminology matter. Okay? Um, sometimes we use a word and some of us will look at that word and we'll think, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And other people will look at it and say, that is awful. Look at justice, social justice. You know, some people think, oh, that's just the latest way. And some people say, well, it goes back to Ezekiel and Isaiah. You know, look at the prophets of all. You know, and, and again, there's some legitimacy, legitimate opinions on both sides of that. You know, we want to try to be careful of using words. That might be harmful. And if this was your question, there are any of those questions. Always feel free to come up and talk to me personally. You know, I'll be glad to have that conversation more offline. Any other questions? Yes, more? Was the cost of property? I think we're insured for five and a half, six million dollars. I mean, we need help. Uh, so we know that our angel, uh, we can find them out. But I mean, that's close. Close. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you know, so that's again, if we had to go out and buy exactly the same thing, that's how much it would cost. Um, if a person has been baptized, can we accept them as a member of the United Methodist Church? I always have. The United Methodist Church, if there's someone who's been baptized and someone who comes and confesses, you know, that's, that's always been standard. We'll be glad to have it. In this one, this next question is above my pay grade. I don't know. I have opinions, but I don't know. Why hasn't the Board of Bishops enforced the discipline that is written? Um, some will say they have, others will say, you know, they haven't. Um, there's part of that. Yeah, part of it. Politics is a part of it. Um, if no decision can be made until after 2028, 23, why have so many churches here in North Georgia already for that? They started the process a year ago. Okay. Uh, they, they had the same kind of timeline, so they, they were having their church conferences in January, February, and March of this year. So they, they started the full year. Um, but at, at this point in time, this is the last opportunity that we know of. Now, I do know that South Georgia Conference has extended the deadline for another year. Don't know if North Georgia will do that or not. I mean, that's, that's, I had some conversations. But no, South Georgia has. Um, I do know some conferences are having specially called annual conferences where they're just dealing with this issue. And some are doing it in this fall. And each state, each conference is different. That's kind of where we are. Um, one more. And again, I'll stay afterwards. <clears throat> Um, 
We disaffiliate and pay what you describe, 150 who owns the facility, this local church does. That's the issue. Correct. Correct. The, the conference does not, does no longer own the property. And for some people, that is the issue. That, that, I think that's a big part of the issue. For some people, the theology is a little bit harsher. For some people, the uh, the brand damage is, is priority. For some people, the um, the cost of the bureaucracy and the trust costs is a big part of the issue. But then on the flip side, we, we talk about the history of the ministry, the connection we have. You know, we have missionaries in a hundred and some different countries. We have decades of history in doing ministry in certain things, in certain areas, doing effective ministry, complaining about some all these things. We've got that. There are just like America. You know, I would I would be, I would venture to say that sometimes in the last eight years you have disagreed with one of our United States, one of our American presidents. Would that be a fair statement to say? Sometime within the last eight years, you disagree. Okay. And we're still here. We're still Americans. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've lived here long. It looks like the United Methodist and the Global Methodists are in agreement on everything. Just about what brought the Seventh Church into disability? What was the thing that they were talking about? Um, I think that last statement from the WCA is a good one. We talk about the various reasons. I think there are some, in most of those churches, most of the seventy churches that have already disappeared were small family churches. Um, I think. Owning my grandfather's church was a big part of it. You know, my granddad, I, I can point you to the Campton United Methodist Church in Walton County. My great great grandfather was the first lady in that church. And there have been members of the Thompson family, that was my grandmother's maiden name, who have been a part of that church ever since. And if there ever was a church, I would want to own it. So there, there's some of that. There's some of it that says, you know, we're tired of fighting. Every year, all we hear about is the fight and the fuss and all this other stuff. And our community thinks, in a lot of those churches, the communities were pretty much in a hundred, I would say hundred percent were. Most of those churches that have already disaffiliated the vote was 90% of the vote. They were pretty homogeneous. Now, a lot of churches in Metro Atlanta, you know, I used to tell people uh, Powder Springs and Top County, I said, we're a purple church. There's some blue and there's some red. And there's a lot of in between. And I think a lot of the churches that were more mixed in their beliefs have not, but I think now is when we're going to start seeing that. And I think for us, that's why we're back in this conversation now. Um, so some of it was theology. Um, some of it was that we didn't think that this was you know, this is what the United Methodist Church should believe. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with the trust clause. Um, a lot of it had to do with, uh, in their community, and again, I, I got rural kid folk, in their community, the United Methodist Church was not a good name. Whether rightfully so or not, it is what it is. And so they said, hey, we would be better off on our own. And a lot of those, well, I can't say that. I don't know. I've, I've heard that a lot of those have not have remained in the That have not been to the global methods or anywhere else. I don't know that for certain. I can find out. Anything you have to do with the bishop? I've heard just so much bad things about with the bishop. Is she not one of the primary reasons? Um, 
it's 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 a little bit of um, let's talk some more. And again, it depends on who you talk to. Um, there are some that are saying I mean, that she's kind of opening the door to other things. I mean, she's she's a former lawyer. I mean, she's very very intelligent and uh, knows how to play the game well, play the game well, and so. You know, you can listen to what she says and what she says and, and what she writes, and you can say, okay, that's okay. But then other people look at what happens with Mount Bethel Church or what happens here or whatever. Again, there are different opinions there. I understand those different opinions. Um, my experience is she said that you're done with I like it for that. I appreciate that. Uh, I, you know, I had to uh, talk to a, a, her sister and said, "Hey, I just felt like at some point people were I was being overlooked. Do my job, and you know, and boom, two weeks later they got called from here. So I appreciate that." We've just gotten started. Please continue to send me questions, and I will try to address these questions on our on the website as well. Um, let's continue the conversation. Hopefully, this has been helpful to an extent. Um, I know how these things go. For some people, this was a disappointment. Nothing new was said. For some people, a lot of new was said. And maybe hopefully it cleared up a little things, or maybe it just made it as clear as mud. That's that's the, the nature of these things. But we will continue this conversation. I'm committed to that. I'm committed to this church. I'm committed to you. Um, I'm committed to doing ministry here in this church. And uh, ask another meeting. Um, um, who can play? I want to see. I want to see as we finish. Or who could be last to lead us in the city? I want to do the Little Red Christian Fire Life. I think that's appropriate. Come on up there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we haven't made that determination yet. Um, I'm open to hearing if you want to have more conversations. You know, today's purpose was to lay out the information. Here's the process. Now, uh, the other conversations, again, I'm committed. If we can have those conversations be kind, be compassionate, be spirit led and spirit filled, then I'm open to having those conversations. Um, I don't want an off kicker. I don't want us to be demonizing the other person who disagrees with us. And so that's what I'm going to do. If we can make it happen without that, if we know we're going to love each other, then yeah, you know, let's have that conversation. But let's talk. I mean, like you said, we haven't we haven't made that determination to answer your question. You know, we wanted to have this one first and then see where we go. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. We'll take that. Thank you. Thank you. Simples. Yeah. You found some work. It's in the faith we sing, isn't it? It's in the oh, it's in the faith we sing. It's in the faith we sing. Two, 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 three. Mrs. Parsons said you could sing better. But stand up. Here we go. Let's stand up. Ready? We are one.
Thank you, my friends. Good to see you. 